Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you everyone for joining. I think we've got a majority of people on. We'll do a roll call in just a little bit, but the Commissioner Keller is on the line and um, we'll go ahead and let him start with his welcome and introduction and remarks. Uh, good morning. I'm Harrison Keller and Commissioner of Higher Education. Uh, it was good to see you all. I think uh, there's at least some of you that I think I could probably confidently say I'm your favorite Commissioner of Higher Education. And um, I really appreciate y'all's willingness to serve on uh, this committee. Uh, of course, we can convene the committee every two years. And uh, because of changes that were made in House Bill 8, uh, you have a couple of new colleagues on this uh, committee. So we've got the Lamar State Colleges represented and also uh, the TSTCs. And so the work that uh, you all are going to embark on is particularly important. Of course, this was a this was a very strong session in general for higher education. And uh, we this is an opportunity for us to continue that momentum. Of course, I, I think we would all agree. We think every session should be a higher education session, but uh, we look forward to working with you all to help set the stage for discussions in the next session. And so we appreciate your work um, to study and provide recommendations on formula funding, um, including, of course, appropriate funding levels and other changes related to formula funding. So ideally, we want to make sure that the financial incentives that are built into the funding systems are going to align with our state higher education goals for building a talent strong Texas and uh, also our changing workforce needs. And I want you all to know we really do uh, appreciate your service and um, your input is very important to us as we work on recommendations that ultimately go to the legislature and the governor's office. So I'll talk briefly about the charges. So the charges uh, before you are going to help shape uh, funding and policy decisions. Um, and as usual, we're asking the committee to consider and recommend appropriate funding levels uh, for all the general academic institution formulas. And that includes the research funds provided directly to institutions to support the important work you do. So this group had previously recommended we include the research funding and also the comprehensive regional university funding as part of that complement of recommendations around formula funds. Uh, we supported that request by making this uh, first charge broad and uh, all encompassing. Uh, you also um, have a charge around uh, the state colleges and TSTC. So the legislature made, of course, significant uh, investments in the state and technical colleges last session. And so the committee is going to be tasked to consider how best to refine the return value uh, model to continue to serve students and boost workforce development. Of course, we've been with this uh, formula a few years. There's a couple of aspects of the formula that probably should be refined and updated so they can better reflect the current um, uh, reality of our labor market and the intent of the formula. Uh, there's a co-charge uh, with the HRIs, and of course, we've been grappling with funding around GAIs and HRIs over the years. We have included a charge to look more closely at the uh, at different funding for HRIs and the GAIs for health programs, and in particular, a broad charge to consider uh, differences in funding for the pharmacy and the nursing programs between the sectors. That's got a lot of implications as uh, there are these, especially for nursing, broader conversations going on about how we uh, can um, improve our uh, our talent pipeline uh, for nursing and address those longstanding shortages. Uh, now, just wrapping up, let me just say that uh, some of you know that uh, prior to taking on this job as commissioner, I had the opportunity to serve on the Formula Advisory Committee and so I appreciate firsthand uh, the work you put into it. And in all candor, I have to say that I found the iterations of the Formula Advisory Committee I served on a little bit frustrating. Um, my strong impression at the time was that a lot of the recommendations were already pretty well baked um, by agency staff. And I didn't necessarily always feel that we had opportunity to explore new directions. So I want to assure you all that that is not the case. Uh, with this committee. And so, as I told your colleagues um, in the community colleges two years ago, my agency team and I are happy to take this as far as you all are willing to go together 
Um, so if you want to recommend more uh, limited, more incremental changes around, uh, that's certainly your prerogative. Uh, but if there are aspects of this work where you all would like to uh, work together to explore more ambitious changes uh, that might give you more room to innovate your programs and better align our funding systems with our changing demographics and workforce needs, we'd be happy to partner with you all. So again, appreciate your time. I appreciate your willingness to take this on. And uh, before I turn it back over, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Commissioner, your layout was so perfect that no one has a single question. <laughs> Either that or everybody just kept their mute buttons on and their comments to themselves, I think, Daniel. Um, but but in any event, uh, About this group. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I know I, I know a lot of y'all pretty well. I thought I would get at least some some comments. Um, any any questions for me before I hand it back over? So this is Joseph Drawn. Can you hear me, sir? Yes. OK, so question. So, I, you know, I think this is maybe the second time I'm on on the committee, but changes or recommendations that we make, how um, I mean, uh, the the possibility of those going through are dependent on what? What's the biggest um, hurdle that we've got to cross to 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 get some of these recommendations through or approved? Uh, well, I mean, I think the biggest hurdle would be just you know this is just an input <laughs> to yeah. the legislative deliberations. I mean, so, so it's um, recommendations. Yeah, these are recommendations. So you know if now, my impression, some of you, I'll defer to you all. Some of you all um, may have a different view. My impression, like, for example, let's say that the GAIs came together and said, you know, we've got a vision for how we could uh, reform our GAI formulas. And you had and you had some pretty strong consensus around that uh, and about what that roadmap ought to look like. My impression is that they would be pretty receptive to, to that. Um, I, if... But if it's, uh, um, you know, the the committee might come back and say, well, we recommend you put an additional billion dollars through the current formula, right? You know, that um, I, I don't get, I would be surprised if they, if they would uh, be really receptive to uh, those kind of recommendations. So this is just, uh, it's an important input uh, to deliberations. I think it can be an opportunity to shape um, the budget and policy discussions, but um, but again, you just need to keep in mind it's just an input, right? And I was mainly referring to like the mechanics if we look at some of these things, and you know, funding obviously is based on the legislature. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. so we're yeah. I mean, so our team happy to work in partnership with you all if you want to model out some different uh, options and consider you know what might be the implications of, of making different kinds of changes. Um, Happy to explore uh, different kinds of options and opportunities with y'all. Thank you. All right, I'd like to introduce um, Daniel Harper. He's the convening chair from um, our last committee and he is going to open the meeting. Thanks, Jennifer. So good morning. So we'll call the General Academic Formal Advisory Committee to order, As Jennifer said, I'm Daniel Harper of Texas State University. System, I had the pleasure of serving as chair a mere two years ago. Um, I'll give our you know, standard warning that this is all being broadcast. So caution what you say, because it'll be archived. Uh, plus, you know, mute your phones uh, so you don't inconvenience the others. And I think with that, we're ready for roll call. Uh, Ms. Albright. Present. Ms. Askins? Present. Dr. Blanchard? Present. Uh, Ms. Brown? Present. Ms. Deardorff? Present. Mr. Deardorff, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Duran? Present. Uh, Ms. Elmore? Present. Dr. Hurley? Oh, he actually, he is not going to be here today. He, he had email that he couldn't make it. Miss um, Cruel. Present. Did I pronounce that right? 
Yes. Okay. Uh, Ms. Salazar. Present. Ms. Sloan. Present. And Mr. Wooten. Present. Great. So we do have a quorum present and you can proceed. The quorum present. So the next item is election of the chair and vice chair. So I will open the floor up for nominations of the committee chair. Well, Daniel, like to, yeah, go ahead. I say I'd like to nominate Daniel Harper to stay our chair. Yeah. I would second that. This is Joseph. I will second. <laughs> All right. So I'm supposed to announce that uh, I consent to the nomination. And so then we've got Emily Deardorff as the first. And I think we got Joseph as the second. And is there any other nominations? All right. Hearing none. I think I guess it says uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All right. Any opposed? All right. Hearing none. Well, thank you all so much. So hopefully I will do a better job than I did two years ago. So, all right. So next up is we have the nomination for the vice chair. Do we have a nomination? I would like to nominate Emily Deardorff. Do we have a second? I will second that. This is Susan. Susan Brown. All right. We won't even give Emily the ability to decline. So I think for ease, since we're on a Zoom call, are any opposed to the nomination of Emily Deardorff as vice chair? Hearing none, congrats, Emily. You are the vice chair of our formal advisory committee. Hi, thank you. All right. And so now I believe we're on to agenda item four, which should be the presentation of the charges by Ms. Emily Cormier. Morning. Um, so I think this is just making sure. Can y'all see my screen? Great. Um, so this is really going through uh, the kind of an overview of the current formula structure for the general academic institutions, state and technical colleges. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Emily Cormier, Assistant Commissioner for Funding. Um, so thank y'all for being here this morning. And there's a lot of slides, but I'll go through it pretty quickly because I know most people on this call are experts in the formula or else you would not be on this committee. Um, and the intention of this is just to set a baseline of what we're talking about and kind of the current state of the formulas. So first of all, you know, formula funding in this state is kind of used in two ways, um, both as an allocation methodology to equitably distribute the funding amongst institutions based on consistent metrics, but it can also be used as a tool to drive state funding based on amounts needed um, to fund any enrollment growth that is seen. So it could be funding the rate. And then the formula funding appropriations reflect how the state funds are allocated to the institutions, but it does not dictate how they must be spent. So obviously each of you um, you know, are able to budget your formula dollars to departments by your own local need, subject to your own board of regions and system approval. And so this next slide is just to kind of um, speak a little bit to the fact that there is that co-charge looking at general academic institutions and health related institutions in the state. So this is actually a more common question that we receive um, about, you know, what is an HRI or what is a general academic institution? Because it's not always the most clear cut um, so this is just to kind of lay out that, you know, there are definitions for the general academics, which are typically those four-year institutions, as well as the upper-level institutions in the state, um, in statute, and in the special provisions of the General Appropriations Act. So there is a listing of who are considered the health-related institutions there as well. And for those, the, they can either be a standalone institution, such as UT Southwestern, 
or it can be a distinct part of a general academic institution, you know, such as University of Houston College of Medicine is an HRI, whereas the University of Houston other programs is a general academic institution. And you see the same thing with like Dell Medical School or um, AM Health Science Center in AIM. And so just to note that these classifications are really a state instituted um, need so that it can affect how institutions report to the core name board and how appropriators fund the different institutions. So it doesn't affect other non-state reporting by the schools. And something that's sort of in the weeds on the formulas, but is important relating to some of the charges, um, looking at some of the inputs to the formulas, this is just to kind of set a baseline understanding that some of the formulas use what's called an all funds methodology. And so that's really for the main two formulas, the instruction and operations and the infrastructure formula. And this basically says is that there's two main income streams that the legislature uses to fund the formulas. This includes general revenue, which is the state's main operating funds and is the predominant um, source of funding for the formulas. And then there's something else called formula general revenue dedicated funding. And so what that is, is it's a portion of the tuition charges that your institution collects. Um, so this is really just statutory tuition predominantly, which is the $50 charge per semester credit hour. And that's just, that is also separate and distinct from other designated tuition collections um, that your institution collects that are not accounted for in the appropriations process. Kind of another baseline uh, slide on here is just noting that for all of the formulas in the general academics, there is a base period that gets used to set the appropriation amount for the following two years. And so the legislature typically just uses whatever is the most recent, um, recently available data that they have at the time that they're meeting um, in the spring of each odd year to set uh, the next two year funding cycle. So for the instruction operations formula, those enrollments that your institution sees next summer and fall, and then the spring when the legislature is meeting will be the input that the, that the legislature uses to set your funding for the next two year cycle. The main formula for the general academics includes the instruction and operations or INO formula. And this is really kind of your um, general faculty salaries, departmental operating expenses, uh, the other listed items on the slide. And the driver is really your course enrollment as of the 12th class day. So those become semester credit hours that are reported to the coordinating board. And then um, a matrix of weights is applied to those semester credit hours to create what's called the weighted SCHs. And the expenditure study is something that the coordinating board completes every year. We'll request data from every general academic institution um, on the cost of, or the expenditures for each level and discipline. And then we consolidate it across all of the institutions to come up with a relative weight matrix um, and basically intended to account for the fact that smaller graduate courses are going to be more expensive to teach than probably lower level liberal arts is going to be. I'd also note on there that there is a 10% bump in this formula called the teaching experience supplement. And that's for those tenured or tenure track faculty that are teaching undergraduate courses. The infrastructure formula um, is really to provide the support for your operations, um, your facilities operations and maintenance and utilities. And the driver is really predicted square feet. And this is derived from the space model that the coordinating board produces every year. And this is actually looking at your faculty, your instruction, uh, your research, and then doing an equitable assessment to come up with what's called the predicted square feet rather than having actual square feet um, used in the model. And then there are two rates in this formula. There's the operations and maintenance rate, which is a statewide rate, and then also a, a utility rate that is unique to every institution. And that's to account for the fact that each institution has different local utility costs um, across the state. 
And so just one thing to point out too, while the instruction and operations form that I just discussed um, before pertains to the general academics, only this infrastructure formula is for the general academics and also your new colleagues on the committee, the state colleges and the technical colleges. So they're funded in the exact same manner through this formula. And as part of the infrastructure formula, we've got the small institution supplement, which is really to provide extra funding for those small institutions for the diseconomies of scale. And so basically those schools that are underneath 5,000 students receive 2.6 million for the biennium. And then that amount proportionally goes down as your head count increases at each of the schools until eventually you top out and you would no longer receive the supplement after you hit 10,000 students. Um, one of the newer formulas that's come online in the past couple of years is the Comprehensive Regional University or the CREW formula funding. Um, this is just for those regional institutions in the state. So it is not for the research or emerging research institutions. Um, and it is predominantly to provide funding to help serve students. And so the formula is made up of two pieces, a base amount that every institution receives in that formula, um, and then a rate multiplied by the three-year average degrees awarded. And those at-risk students are considered um, or are defined via statute as being a Pell Grant recipient or having an SAT or ACT score that's below the national average. And so this chart is something I think you've probably all seen before in the materials, but really just to kind of ground the you know, increases that have been made over the past few years, um, you know, in both of the last two legislative cycles. The legislatures put in more than 300 million into the formulas um, in the last two sessions and, you know, really focused on the affordability proposal um, this past time. But, you know, looking at just the straight, you know, formula general revenue doesn't really show us much because it doesn't account for the fact that the schools see growth or, you know, um, in the students that they're serving. So on the next slide, we also just kind of put together a chart that shows those rates, which really account for, you know, what it, what it actually meant on a per student basis. And so obviously the increased funding from this last time really helped um, raise that rate um, after being pretty stagnant for the past decade. But, you know, one thing to note is that this is looking at just straight instruction operations or inf infrastructure rates. And so that doesn't account for the fact that inflation's occurred. And so, you know, if you looked at it in different ways, it might show kind of different, different insights. And then as the commissioner mentioned, you know, research funding is now fully a part of the formula advisory committee process. And so this is to kind of note that there were some significant legislative changes that occurred in the past legislative session for research. Um, this is from HB 1595 and it's associated constitutional amendment HJR 3. Um, and I should say these are all not in effect yet. Um, they would be contingent, all these changes are contingent on the passage of that constitutional amendment when it's voted on in November. So this is still kind of TBD, but for the purposes of our materials, we've made an assumption that it will pass and that we'll revise accordingly if needed. And so what this legislation did is it redesignated the National Research University Fund as the Texas University Fund. Um, for four institutions. And as a note, since that fund is not formula allocated, or it's not a formula funding in the traditional sense, it's not part of these discussions, but just for context, we wanted to make people aware of it. It also redesignated the core research support fund as the national research support fund, and those are for those PUF eligible institutions, and then aligns the methodology or the allocation of funding for both the National Research Support Fund and the Comprehensive Research Fund um, based on more focused on federal and private research expenditures. The National Research Support Fund also has a portion of funding that's based on the research doctors awarded. Um, this legislation did not affect the Texas Research University Fund that's specific for UT and a &M, And so that fund is based solely on the total research expenditures of those institutions. 
And so the, again, this is just kind of a, a slide to set the stage that, you know, there was also increased funding relating to these legislative changes. Um, and one of the ones I just want to point out is obviously the comprehensive research fund doubled, um, which was pretty impactful for the you know, large group of institutions that received this. So it went from 14 million to 30 million, which is um, a pretty significant increase over the, the past cycle. So moving on to the state and technical colleges. So as I mentioned, the state and technical colleges received their infrastructure support through the same formula that the general academics do, uh, but the Lamar State College Instruction and Administration formula is slightly different from the kind of more analogous INO formula. So their driver is contact hours, which again are based on you know enrollments as of the 12th class state. And then theirs is also weighted by a cost study. Um, it's not the same cost study or expenditure study used as the general academics. It's a cost study that's done on all of the two-year institutions, so including the community colleges and the technical colleges. And that composes the majority of their state funding that they receive. And so here's kind of a, a similar chart about their rates over time. You know, the legislature has made significant investments in the state colleges over the past few cycles. And so this is just to kind of note the, the growth in the rates that they've seen. The Texas State Technical College has a separate instruction administration formula called a return to value formula. And so the premise of this is basically uh, rooted in the job earnings of students after they leave the technical colleges. So it compares earnings of students um, against minimum wage to determine the value add of the TSTC education. Um, so then there's a couple of factors relating to economic activity and return tax value. Um, and then that legislature determines the amount of the split between TSTC and the state and appropriates funding back to the institutions. And so TSTCs have you know, consistently requested 36% of the return value to be returned to them. Um, and you can see this last session, there was quite an increase in return value, um, drove 50 million more in formula dollars uh, to the TSTCs relating to higher earnings um, and larger cohort and inflation. And so just to kind of wrap this up, um, as the commissioner mentioned, you know, you guys will be meeting this fall to go through and develop recommendations on the charges or, or wherever you'd like to go with those um, charges that he's laid out. And then, you know, you'll be bringing in the spring those recommendations to the commissioner and our board. And so we wanted to lay out here that kind of the role of the advisory committee and the planning board is really, obviously we're required by statute to do this and to convene this um, group of experts every two years. But you know, really the use of the recommendation is to provide those signals or inputs to the state policymakers um, on a bigger picture level. But on a more practical level, it does filter down into how our agency will require reporting by the institutions to us to make sure when we provide the data to the Legislative Budget Board and the governor's office, it conforms to the recommendations that are ultimately provided. And last, slide is really just a recap of the charges. So I'm happy to wrap it up and take any questions if there are any. No questions for me? We're hearing none. Um, next on the agenda is the discussion of the charges. You know, we have five charges. Um, and as the commissioner said, you know, our committee looks a little different this cycle than it did two years ago. Um, and I kind of like to maybe propose a working structure for our five charges. I will start with a charge two. Uh, my recommendation to this group is that we delegate a recommendation for charge two to Wendy Elmore at Lamar State College Orange to bring back to our committee to review. And for charge three, the same, delegate that to Chad Wooten at TSTC to bring back their recommendation, and then the committee can consider that. Um, any opposition to that kind of 
operating recommendation. All right. Well, hearing none, um, Wendy and Chad, I'll, we'll defer to y'all to bring back a recommendation. Um, that leads us to charge one, four, and five. Um, you know, when I look read these charges, four and five are definitely very technical charges. And, you know, two years ago, we used a subcommittee approach to address those charges. Um, I'd recommend to the group that we use that same methodology and we create a, a subcommittee of, say, five people on our full committee to look at charge four and five people of the full committee to look at uh, charge number five. I mean, I'm open if that number needs to be six, but... I think we have we have 13 on the committee, so I guess six is as large as we can get before it constitutes a, a majority. Um, any opposition to four and five being done in a subcommittee approach? All right. Hearing none, that gets to the most exciting part of today's agenda, which will be... Uh, I guess nominating somebody or holding somebody to uh, chair four and to chair five. Um, do we have a recommendation for a chair for charge four? This is Noelle Sloan. I would like to nominate Joseph Duran for charge number four. I'll second that. This is Susan. I will second. Yeah. Joseph, you have no friends on this committee, do you? <laughs> Thank you for that. I'd, I'd be glad to accept that, sure. that charge. Any opposition to uh, Joseph running the subcommittee before? I'm hearing none. And then, Joseph, I'll figure between you and Emily Cormier will work on uh, the what makes up that subcommittee. Sounds good. Yes, sir. I assume people will do that offline. Um, so that leads us to charge five. Do we have a uh, do we have somebody we want would like to run charge five? Daniel, this is Joseph. Um, if Emily Deardorff is okay, I'd like to nominate her for number five. Right. We won't let her go off mute to say no. So, <laughs> all right, and then I will do the same thing, Emily. The, Cormier and Emily Deardorff will work together and get a we'll work offline to constitute that. So uh, my thought on charge one, and I could go either way on it, seems as if it's a charge that we can cover as a full committee, but I don't, but I'm open to thoughts and suggestions. Um, you know, to kind of when I think through the charge, we have two kind of issues that uh well, before the meeting, we had one issue, and then Joseph had to ask a question and get us a second issue, is, you know, with the affordability compact that the general academics have, you know, what's going to be the real impact on charge one and, you know, maintaining, you know, our position where we are today. Uh, but then also, you know, is what Joseph kind of alluded to or the commissioner spoke to is, that seems like the charge in which we would put if we had ideas that were outside of the status quo and we wanted to consider those items. So, um, I don't know, any thoughts from the collective group on our approach on charge one? Yeah, yeah, I would support what you propose to uh, you know, move forward as a committee. I think this is one that you'll find interest from all areas, and that would be um, a way to manage through, you know, the collective consensus and ideas. Thanks, Veronica. All right. Okay. So we've walked through our charges. We're excited about our delegated charges and our subcommittee charges. So. Uh, Emily Corey, do we want to just start on charge one today? I mean, is, do we want to walk through materials? What do you think? Uh, of your I'll actually defer over to Jennifer Gonzalez. She's going to be your main point of contact on, on this committee. Sorry, Jennifer. Oh, that's no problem. 
Yeah, I mean, it's totally up to y'all. Did y'all want to determine the subcommittee members at this time? Or, or talk about them and then decide the subcommittee members? My, my presumption or my recollection from two years ago is that, you know, it's probably best to do it offline to see who's interested. I know, um, you know Dr. Hurley's not here and my recollection is he likes to be actively engaged. So I'm sure he'll want an opportunity to chime in on if one of those two subcommittees was something he'd be interested in. So I would assume that just maybe work between you and the respective chairs on the makeup of that committee. So. Okay. So, uh, so I have, a, I have a quick question, if you don't mind. So if um, if there is interest in serving on one of the respective ones, we just contact the chair and let the chair know. Yes, sir. Thank you. So, uh, so with that, so Jennifer, do we want to, I guess, walk through the packet of materials related to the to the various charges, starting with charge one? That's up to you. I think so. I, if y'all would want to start delving into it. All right. Um, so best approach, Jennifer, what are you thinking? I mean, uh, we could pull the slide up on the screen and just walk through the various pages and then see if that leads to a natural discussion or we can come back and you know, have people start thinking through it offline and we can come back and pick it up at our next meeting, so. That works too. We also need to, yeah, determine dates for the, the next meeting. So if we wanna do that piece now and if y'all wanna talk about the charges in the subcommittees, we can do that too. Okay. All right, so we'll pause on that and we'll move to the next agenda item, which is gonna be six. So, um, Proposed dates in the materials, I think it's in Appendix C. Um, we've got 10 a.m. on the 27th of September, November 1st, December 6th, and January 10th. Um, um, so I guess we've got those. If there's any grand objection to any of those dates, we can adjust. They, um, they work on my schedule, so. I can accommodate them and didn't know if the collective group has any strong opinion on the dates that we have. Daniel? Yes, ma'am. This is Noelle. Can you clarify? My Appendix C shows a range of dates. Did you just state that uh, the recommendation is for the Wednesdays at 10 a.m.? Oh, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I should have been more clear. I was going back over. Yes, so we have... We have Proposal is for Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. on the 27th, the 1st of November, December 6th, and January 10th. Okay, thank you for that clarification. It's fine with me. Hey, Daniel, can we see if there's any objection if we did that meeting too on the 26th? I'm just saying that's a Tuesday. I would be oh. unable to attend. Okay. What about the Thursday? Sorry, I mean, we could send it also like a survey if you like to see where we can almost attend the having the ranges, you know, we can provide the most availability. That's a possibility so we don't have to go through the dates here. Uh. Jennifer, I assume you have a calendaring um, app to do that. Oh, yeah. We currently have um, the 27th and the 28th held. If y'all decide to meet on site for Zoom, we can pretty much choose any of those dates. Um, the the dates that you actually listed, Daniel, were dates that we do have held in case you do decide to meet um, in person. So that's another point of discussion is whether y'all wanna have these all virtually or if y'all are interested in um, meeting in person too. But basically we have the 27th and 28th of September held 
for in-person um, and could do virtually the 26th through the 28th. Um, and then the November 1st and 2nd are held um, in person currently. There's not any held for um, December because we kind of figured at that point you might be wrapping it up virtually, but for, for the December and possible January meeting. All right. So to Veronica's suggestion, why don't we send out a poll and allow the committee to select the dates that work best and we'll see what the most availability we can have. But before we do that, I guess to uh, Jennifer's point, um, if we want to do these in person or virtual, and I can predict your next question is going to be, can we do them hybrid? Um, so I'll ask, do we have the ability to do these hybrid where some are in person and some people are remoting in? I believe we do. Another, I, I think we can do that. Um, something else to consider is like the, um, parking and stuff downtown or whether we have it somewhere else. I mean, it's, it's, um, but anything is possible. We'll try to work around what y'all want to do. So um, as I work downtown, I'm indifferent on a uh, block up all three to the core main border, staying where I'm at. Um, so I'll I guess we'll ask the group if there's a preference, if we want to do them in person, virtual or attempt a, a hybrid. I know the hybrid is, has some limitations for those that are virtual with half of us in person. Well, Daniel, this is Joseph. I'm, I'm fine with uh, the Zoom or the WebEx version. Um, I think those work okay, but I'm flexible as well. And I'll make the 27th work as well. So I didn't mean to. It'll be that bouncing around. She's I would agree that the the Zoom um, format has worked for us well. I think most of our meetings were that way um, two years ago. Yep. How about this? Do we have any opposition to doing these virtually? Right. I'm hearing no opposition. All right, so we'll send out a, a poll to get the best availability per Veronica's recommendation, we'll run them as virtual. Um, so now we've got the question is if we want to go back and review charge one. At least, can I interject? At least for the September meeting, or did I just hear Joseph? Is everyone available for the September 27th date? I'm good. So let's set that one so we have, you know, our next meeting date. And then I can, um, if we're concerned about the date for November, I can send polls for that one in December. If that, is anyone have conflict with the Wednesday, November 1st? I'm good with November 1st. <laughs> Any conflict with, with December 6th? I would, I would have conflict on the September one and then December one, but if I'm the only one, then that's okay. Let me send out a poll on the December one and, and we can see if there's a date where it, where you can make it to, so. You said December one, but I think you meant November one. Is that Jennifer? Oh, did I misspeak? So yeah, it would be September 27th, uh, November one, December six. How about this? If anybody has a conflict with one of those dates, email me. And then at that point, maybe we can pull if, if there's a date where people can move to. But let's at least set the um, the September one, if that's OK with everyone. Works for Chad. It works for me. It works for Chad.
So Jennifer, we have uh, September 27th, November 1st, December 6th, and then if needed, January 10th. I mean, I think. Yes, and if any of those conflict with you with somebody, just email me directly, and then we can see if you know if, if enough people can move to another date and consider it at that time. Also, since a lot of the work will be do, be done in subcommittees, like if as long as that person is being able to make like the subcommittee, that will probably be the most important piece too. So. Sorry, working groups. <laughs> so Jennifer, for the working groups, will we just need to work with you uh, once we figure out the committee, the committee members and a date for those subcommittee or work group meetings to get the Zoom, like the logistics nailed down? Yeah, we can help set up uh, Zoom if y'all want, if y'all want to work it through that way, we can help y'all set those up. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And Jennifer, along those same lines, um, help me remember, uh, once we get the working groups uh, set up, um, what I say is as the, um, as a subcommittee chair of number four, would I just go ahead and coordinate with them and it would just be us meeting or do we need to include or coordinate? I mean, with you? It's really up to y'all. I mean, we can we can attend so that we can help provide any data that y'all are looking for for those. Um, um, but it's technically a working group is not an official like we won't have to take official notes and stuff like that from from those meetings. So okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, well, we got a date. So with that. I suggest we po we postpone our discussion on charge one until September 27th to allow everybody time to review the charge and dig into it and get uh, probably the best use of everyone's time. So unless there's objection to that, I think we're uh, we're ready to adjourn our uh, inaugural meeting of our formal advisory committee. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Here from me. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. So I'm good. All right. So Joseph Duran is our first. Susan Brown is our second. All right. Everyone, well, we'll be back together um, for formula advisory September 27th, 10 a.m. And you know, for those interested in the working group on charge four or five, uh, please you know, reach out to the respective chair and Jennifer. Yeah. Daniel, can I ask another question though? Or I know we, this has to do with meetings, but the only request I may ask on the 27th is that maybe we start at nine. Is that any objection or should I have asked her sooner? Yeah, we like to play fast, so um, <laughs> I have no objection to nine. I'll uh, let- But I was, gonna, I was gonna send it to Jennifer to see. We'll we'll accommodate whatever the the group needs. Nine nine is fine with us if it's if that's what the rest of the committee wants. And and since they're virtual, we have a lot of flexibility too. So. All right, we will send an email to clarify exactly when the time of our next meeting is to the group. So. All right. Well, thanks everybody. I appreciate it, and uh, we'll be back in a few days. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone.